if you work on vintage watches long enough, it won't take long before you run into a mainspring that's either completely the wrong size or the mainspring is too weak and it doesn't provide enough power to the escapement, which is resulting in low amplitude. Whatever the case is, if you're going to be in this game, you're going to need to be able to figure out for yourself what size mainspring that barrel should have in it. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. Look, ever since COVID started, there's been a boom in watch repair interest. And you're going to buy a watch where the movement has been worked on by someone who knows less than you do. Now, that's not a knock against you, but I want you to think about that for a second. Home watchmakers will sell their movements that they can't fix or they can't get to run. They'll sell them on eBay. So if you're buying non-runners or vintage movements, you can never trust that things are going to be original or correct in the movements that you're buying. If you work on pocket watches, that pocket watch literally may have been worked on five or six times before it even got to your bench. Now look, there's tons of scenarios and reasons that an amateur or even a working watchmaker may have put an incorrect mainspring in a barrel. And there's all kinds of problems that can be caused by it. If it's too short, it may have a shortened power reserve, which can affect your daily rate. If the mainspring is too strong, the amplitude may be too high and you may be getting knocking, which can cause damage to the movement itself. If the mainspring is too weak, the amplitude will be too low. Now, if the mainspring is too wide, it may not fit into the barrel properly causing friction and wear on the inside of the barrel. And if it's too narrow, the spring may be twisting a bit inside the barrel, causing wear again. Now, I'm going to bet that the majority of you watching this video probably assume that mainspring sizes are an absolute. Well, if you're working on modern movements, you probably should stick with what the manufacturer is calling for, but it's important for you to know that you do have some leeway when sizing a mainspring in vintage watches. And you don't really have to follow the exact factory sizing in, in most of these cases. Let me give you an example. You might have a seven jewel watch that's suffering from low amplitude because there is wear in the undual pivot holes. Now, you could certainly fix that problem by rebushing the holes, but what if that's not an option because of either your current skill level or maybe you have the skill, but the value of the movement doesn't really justify the amount of work that needs to be put into it to fix all the jewel holes. Well, another thing that you can do is just to increase the strength of the mainspring, which is going to increase the available power coming out of the barrel that's going to compensate for the wear in the movement that's eaten up all your power before it even gets to the escape. How many times have you heard me say that 70% of the mainspring's power is actually lost by the time it gets to the escape? By increasing the power of the mainspring, this means that there's going to be more available power at the pallet fork. If you were looking into mainspring sizing theory, DeCarl uses what's known as the rule of thirds, which simply says that if you took a barrel and split it in half, one third of that space should be the arbor, one third of that space should be the unwound mainspring, and a third of that space should be just open. As you can see in this diagram, the unwound spring 
is slightly less than one third. Now, in George Daniel's book, Watchmaking, he says that the spring should take up exactly half the area between the arbor and the barrel wall. And in the Swiss theory of horology, it says that the mainspring should always occupy always occupy 50% of the open space in the barrel, no matter if it's at rest or if it's fully wound. Now, in the General Resorte's catalog, there are around 150 different springs just for 11 millimeter barrels alone, which range in thickness from uh, 95 thousandths of a millimeter uh, up to 16 hundredths of a millimeter with lengths from 300 to 400 millimeters. So why all the differences of opinion and why are all these different sizes out there? Well, I don't know the exact answer to why there's so many sizes, but what this is clearly saying is that mainspring sizing is not an exact science. And you do have some leeway when fitting a mainspring as long as you stay within certain parameters. Okay, so now I'm gonna share how I learned to size mainsprings. And we're going to compare this formula that I'm gonna show you to a couple of known mainspring sizes. First, to determine the strength or the thickness of the mainspring. You measure the inside dimension of the barrel. Okay, so you measure the inside of the barrel with your calipers and divide it by 87. To get the length of the mainspring, you use the inside dimension again and you multiply it by 30 uh, for American movements, or American pocket watches, or 35 for Swiss movements. Now, to get the width of the mainspring, you just measure inside the barrel from the bottom of the barrel to the top edge. And then you subtract the thickness of the lid plus another uh, one tenth of a millimeter for clearance. Now let's test this formula against a couple known mainspring sizes. Okay, so first we're going to measure the barrel out of an ETA 2824. Now the inside dimension of the barrel is 11 millimeters. So we're going to take 11 millimeters divided by 87, and that equals 126 thousandths of a millimeter. So that's going to be our strength, or thickness. When we multiply the barrel ID by 35 to get our length, we come up with 385 millimeters. Now, to get the width, or the height of the mainspring inside the barrel, we measure from the bottom of the barrel to the top edge, which is 1.64 millimeters. And then we're going to subtract a tenth of a millimeter for clearance, along with the thickness of the lid, which is 0.31 millimeters. All right, now in this case, we came up with a width of 1.23 millimeters by a strength of 0.126 millimeters by a length of 385 millimeters. And the ETA specs are 1.23 by 0.125 by 400. So as you can see, it's almost identical. Now let's do another one. This time we're gonna do an American pocket watch, uh, which is the Elgin model 315. Now I can look up the part number and my original factory parts book, and I'll cross-reference that part number in my Swiger catalog to get a factory mainspring size of 2.05 millimeter by a strength of 0.196 millimeter by a length of 508 millimeters. When I measure the barrel, I get an inside dimension of 15 and a half millimeter. And if I divide that by 87, I get a strength of 0.179, which is off by less than two hundredth of a millimeter. 
Now, when I multiply the barrel ID by 30, I get a mainspring length of 547 millimeters, which is almost 40, mil 40 millimeters longer than the factory spec. Uh, but it would easily fit into this big barrel, which has an inside circumference of about 48 and a half millimeters. So there's plenty of room for one extra coil. When I measure the barrel depth, I get 2.59 millimeter. So then I just subtract 0.1 millimeter for clearance. And then I subtract the thickness of the lid, which is another 0.5 millimeter, leaving me um, 1.9 millimeter, which is only 15 hundredths of a millimeter smaller in width than the factory size of 2.05. So that'll work fine. So what's the takeaway here? Well, if you're having a problem with low amplitude, you have to start troubleshooting at the power source. You have to verify that the mainspring is correct, or at least that it's not too weak. Only then, once that's verified, can you start working your way through the powertrain to the escapement. And guys, if you start checking your mainspring size, it will make you a better watchmaker.